In this time of Lent, we're reflecting on our Lord Jesus Christ and we're thinking about His story, what He went through, and uh, we're reflecting on how that is also our story. His story is our story. When you put your faith in Christ, you don't just believe in Him, you take on His life, you take on His death, His resurrection, His mission, His sufferings, and His inheritance, His privileges. And being a Christian means that we die with Him, even. We're going to read about that. Romans chapter 6. Chapter 6, starting at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your moral body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. A lot of language in here that refers to us dying with Christ. Jesus didn't just die for us, we also die with him. So in verse 2 it says we, we died to sin, we did. In, in verse 4 it says we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. Verse 6, our old self was crucified with him. Verse 8, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. There's a lot of language here, even repetitious language, that when Christ died, we, we died with him. His death wasn't just his death, it was our death too, so that we would live a new life. That's what we're going to reflect on today. So let's think about Jesus for a minute. Let's think about what his death is. He died on the cross to save us from our sins. Perhaps that seems elementary, but that's very deeply profound. He, he died on the cross to save us from our sins. He, he died as a punishment for all of our sins, but he hadn't done anything wrong. And he suffered and died so that we would live. Just think about that for a minute. Mine was the transgression, but his, the deadly pain. He suffered all of the curses of sin so that we would live. To save us from our sins. When he was growing up, he was raised under all of those Old Testament laws that that you can find in the Old Testament, ones that we don't usually pay that much attention to all the time, all those sacrifices and, and all of that. He was raised under all of that and he followed all of those laws. He he observed all those festivals and he was circumcised on the eighth day, just like the law says. But he died under that Old Testament law. 
to that Old Testament law. He, he died under that system. If, uh, you look at the screen here with me. So he died under the Old Testament law. Is it significant that he was crucified instead of dying some other way? Yes, this death convinces me that he shouldered the curse which lay on me. Since death by crucifixion was a curse by God. It says in the Old Testament that everybody who's hung is, is cursed. So when he was hung on the cross, that means that he was symbolically cursed by God. So he lived upholding all of these laws, but he died as the worst offender. Imagine following all of those laws to a T and then dying as if you'd broken all of them. That's not fair, is it? That's the opposite of fair. He, he followed all those laws to a T and then he suffered all of the punishments as if he had broken all of them. He, he was circumcised on the eighth day. He observed those festivals. He paid the temple tax and, and he didn't sin. He didn't break any of those commandments. But in Galatians 3.13 it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So he became the curse for us. And it was his love for us that killed him. It was our sin that put him there. And it was his love that held him there. He didn't have to stay on that cross. He had the ability to come down at any time. When they were taunting him, hey, if you were the son of God, why don't you come down? He certainly could have. He was the son of God. But he loved us. And because of that, he had a mission to complete. And that's what kept him there. He died there because he loved us. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. It says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. So we are called to, to love because he loved us and died for us. Ephesians 5.25, it's talking to husbands here, but look at how it applies it. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He, he died because he loved us. He stayed on that cross and endured all that pain because he loved us. John 15.12, this is Jesus talking. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. This is, this is the love that Christ had for us. So he's saying to us, I, I love you, and I love you so much that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die for you. In Revelation chapter 1, it even says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. He loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood. He was caring about us and he was thinking about each one of us when he was staying on that cross. So what could have been going through his mind there? I, I, I could come down, but, but I'm, I'm, thinking about, I'm thinking about all these people. He was thinking about you. He could have lived the best of life, but he chose the worst death. If you think about all that he was, think about what potential that he had. You know, when you, when you see a young person who, ha who has gifts and, and skills, and you think, boy, this, this kid's going to go places because look at what they can do already. Here's a guy who could stop storms. Here's a guy who could walk on water. Here's a guy who could make crippled people walk blind sea. Here's a guy who could raise the dead. 
Think of what other kind of life he could have had. Think of, think of all of, the, all of the, the glory that he could have had. Think of all of the people who would have flocked to him for, for all kinds of answers. Think of all of the people he could have helped. He could have toured the world doing all these things. And the world would have made him their king because of all that he could have done. He could have wowed everybody. He could have even just settled down and had a nice, quiet life with a nice family and stuff. He didn't. He chose the worst death possible. And he submitted to that. Crucifixion was so bad that only slaves would face that death. Only the most despised people in society would actually be crucified. In fact, crucifixion was so horrible that you didn't mention it in polite conversation. If you were, if you were just talking with people, you, you wouldn't mention it because it was just so horrible to think about. Because if you were going about your business on an average day, you'd see these people hanging on crosses people condemned to die and used and hung there as an example of this is, what, this is what happens to you when you rebel against the empire. And it would be horrifying to see that. And they did it publicly so that nobody would ever challenge Rome. He could have had everything that we go after. All of the stuff that we esteem in our lives all of the stuff that we look up to, all of the stuff we would want for us and for our kids, he could have had it all. And he had none of it. In fact, he chose the opposite of that. He chose the worst of deaths. All of us, we, we'd like a, a quick and painless death, right? He chose the worst, the worst death possible. Because he loved us. He chose the worst way because it was the only way to save us. It was the only way. So look at the screen here with me. Why did Christ have to go all the way to death? Because God's justice and truth demand it. Only the death of God's Son could pay for our sin. It was the only way. There was no other way to do it. To save us, he had to do it that way. It was the only way to save sinners. When he was in Gethsemane, you know this story, he prayed to God and he prayed desperately and he was sweating so bad that it was like drops of blood falling from his head. And he was praying, Father, if it is possible, if there's any other way, Please take this cup from me. Please. But, but not as I will, as you will. And of course we know it wasn't taken away. He had to drink that cup. He had to go through death by crucifixion. There was no other way. He did it because he loved us. And there was no other way to save us. So that's his death. That's the death that we are baptized into. And as believers in Christ, that's the death that is our death too. So let's think about what that means for us for a minute. In Galatians 2.20, uh, I have this on the back page of your booklets if you, if you uh, have those out. It says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the life that we live today, we live by faith in him because he gave his life for us. So his death defines our life. The fact that he died 
changes how we live. Because he died and because we died with him, that means some things for us. One thing is that sin is dead to me and I will not resurrect it. Sin is dead to me. Our our Christian life is defined by his death. And so all of us, when we are facing temptations, when we are charting our course in life, our, our next steps and so forth, We need to remember that there's a a way of life that we could choose that is dead to us. A way of life that we are not going to choose because that is what crucified our Lord. And we're going to steer away from that. We're not going to want anything to do with it. We're going to walk in newness of life. So sin is dead to me. Maybe make that something that you say to yourself every so often. Sin, sin is dead to me. It's dead to me. It's crucified with Christ. So even as you put your faith in Him, sin is dead to you. It's been crucified. It's gone. It's done. Imagine, imagine that you're a slave. Imagine that somebody just snatches you, drugs you, takes you to the other side of the world, and forces you to Do all kinds of work. Lift in heavy bricks, sweeping floors, and you have no way to get out. No no way to escape. You don't know the language. You don't have your passport. You are just a nobody in a foreign country, and you have to do everything that your master says. And if you don't, they beat you. They beat you until you can't move anymore. That's slavery. And it happens to tons of people around the world. Sin is described as slavery. We're kind of forced to do things that we'd rather not do. Now let's say, let's say that being a slave in this other country where you have no way of escape and you're just beaten if you, if you don't do what you're supposed to do. Let's say that that slave owner is killed and you're brought back to this country. You don't have to follow that slave owner anymore because he's dead. This is the picture that the Bible gives us for what happened to sin when Christ died on the cross. We don't have to obey that anymore. All these temptations that we face, we don't have to obey that. That's that's a, a dead slave owner that we used to have. So we can just say, no. Forget it. So, sin is dead to me. And I am dead to the old law, and I'm under Christ's law. So, we don't usually look back in Leviticus to see how we're supposed to sacrifice animals and how we're supposed to sprinkle the blood and what all the priests are supposed to do and what they're supposed to wear and stuff like that because, because Christ covered over those laws. He fulfilled them all. And so we don't have to do that that way anymore. In Romans 7, 4, it says, So my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, again, his death is our death, that you might belong to another, to him who is raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. So, so we're not slaves to codes and, and rules and, and rituals anymore. We wake up every morning and we say, okay, Lord, how can I serve you today? It's a whole new way of looking at life. So we submit to the Father's authority, showing the love that he has shown us. It doesn't mean we can do whatever we want. It doesn't mean we can disregard what God says. But it's a whole new way of looking at life. This was... This was the big challenge of Jesus' first followers. Okay, now that we have Jesus and now that he's died for our sins, okay, what does that mean for all of these Old Testament laws that, that we used to follow? Do we still have to follow these or not? So a lot of the New Testament is actually saying, uh, no, Christ died for that, and when he did, he fulfilled all of that. And so we don't have to go through all of those rituals anymore. 
That's, isn't, that, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> then we don't have to do all that stuff anymore. We have a new law that we follow, and that's the law of Christ and the, his life and his love that he's shown us. So in Galatians 6.2, it says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So we serve one another that way. 1 Corinthians 9.21, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So it's like we have a new law to follow. There's a new sheriff in town. And this, this love that Christ has shown us, this is not just a warm, fuzzy love, like the kind that we usually think of. This is, this is a love that, that's lethal. The love that Christ has shown us is a lethal love. And so my Christian love will be lethal to me. That's the love He's shown us. That's the love we need to show too. He loved us to death, literally. So, for those of you who have children, the love that you have for them is pretty strong, isn't it? You'd, you'd take a bullet for your kids, wouldn't you? Because you care about them so much. Your, your love is lethal. You would die for your kids. There's, there's people that we would die for. We, we care about them that much. We would rather us die so they could live. That's the love that Christ has shown us. That's the love that we're called to love. Not the warm, fuzzy love. The love that would give up that much. To love like Christ means being in danger of dying. So our goal is to love so much that we are in danger of losing our own lives. I'm not talking being foolish. I'm talking that kind of commitment. We are so committed to the Lord and to his people that we would be willing to sacrifice our lives if so called. We'd do it. In 1 John 3, it says this. This is how we know what love is. This is what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. We're supposed to, you, you see what Christ did? We're supposed to do that for one another. And then it goes on. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? And then it says, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So, we need to be sacrificing for, for others. For Especially, it says our brothers here, that usually means fellow believers. If, if there's one of us that's in need and we just say, I'll see you later, how can the love of God be in us? Because the love of God sacrifices, even to the point of death. So if you want the love of Christ, that love needs to be so strong that it, it could kill you. That's the love he's shown us. And my success is now defined by dying on a cross. When, when we chart our course in life and we kind of think of, okay, what kind of life would I like to have? Usually, our lives would probably look a lot like the life that Christ chose not to live. We, we, want, we want the comforts, we want, we want the health, we want the, the wealth and, and the, the safety, the security and all of that. We, you know, we want the, the glory. And, and Christ chose none of that. He chose an entirely different way. And now our success is defined by that. It's a whole different way of looking at whether we're successful or not. 
whether we're achieving our objectives or not. So him dying on a cross, and this is the Lord that we follow, victory is redefined for us. Success is redefined. The cross is opposite of everything that we'd want, and it was everything that he chose. So what does this mean for our lives now? It means, it means we've got to look at him differently. If, if Christ is our Lord, and we've died with him, that means that life is found in death. It means that joy is found in suffering. It means that power is gained through submission. Jesus was the most powerful person who walked this earth, and the entire time he was submitting to his Father. Glory is in shame. The cross is the ultimate emblem of of suffering and shame, and he embraced it, and that was his finest hour, and we celebrate that today. What was supposed to be his shame turned out to be his glory, so that's the case for us too. Gain is in loss. He gained the name that is above every name because he went through this. So we gain by losing. And victory is through defeat. This should have been the end of him. He should have been a footnote in some history book. And yet more people know who he is than maybe any other historical figure. This should have been his end. And it was his beginning. The cross redefines what success is in our life. So where are you going in your life? Are you going towards a a cross? the life of Christ, the one that he chose, or or are we going with everybody else and everything that they're after? At the end of Galatians, it says this, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. We have a whole different way of defining success and victory now. So Jesus chose this because it was the only way. It was the only way to save us. That means that I will live by grace in Christ because it's the only way that I'm saved. This is the only way. If we could be right with God by being good people, and we like to think we're good people, right? If we could be right with God that way, then Christ died for nothing. We might as well be telling him on the cross, eh, you shouldn't have bothered. I, I'm, I'm a good person. I didn't need this. So we have to die to any notion that we can save ourselves, that we can merit God's favor, that we are good people even. Jesus didn't die for good people, he died for sinners. And that we can have anything of ourselves to offer God on the last day. If you're standing before God on that last day, And he says something to you like, well, why should I let you into heaven? Don't start running off all the good things that you've done in your life or how many times you went to church or how many times you read the Bible. That's that's not going to cut it. You've got to offer the blood of Christ. This is the only way that I can enter into heaven. That's the only way. If it wasn't the only way, Jesus would have done something else. But it was the only way. And that's our only way too. I have a quote that I put on the screen here. I really like the way it's put this. It says, No religious observances or good deeds of ours could ever earn our forgiveness. Yet a great many people in the post-Christian West, the Western world, have fallen for this caricature of Christianity. They then understandably see no fundamental difference between the Christian gospel and the Eastern religions For they regard all religion as a system of human merit. God helps those who help themselves, they say. But there is no possibility of reconciling this notion with the cross of Christ. It totally redefines everything. He died to atone for our sins for the simple reason that we cannot atone for them ourselves. If we could, his atoning death would be redundant 
Indeed, to claim that we can secure God's favor by our own efforts is an insult to Jesus Christ. For it is tantamount to saying that we can manage without him. He really not, need not have bothered to die. We're not good people. We're saved by the blood of Christ and his grace. And we must humble ourselves before God and accept that we are saved by his grace and be thankful to him. Be good people because you are thankful, not because you need it to get his favor, his love, or to get into heaven. It was the only way, and it's our only way too. His death defines our life. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord God in heaven, we're thankful for Jesus Christ. We're thankful that he went all the way to death, even death on a cross, so that we might live a new life, a redeemed life that doesn't follow sin anymore and that lives by grace. We pray, Lord, that that grace would seep into our hearts and that we would overthrow, overflow with thankfulness and love for you, the kind of love that you have shown us. In Jesus' name, amen.